Okay. And, and on this computer, you have to click on the object. Now I have this. So you, you, uh, uh, do you get it? Ah, oh, 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 you can do so. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I have to be able to move my. Yeah, is it working? I'm sorry for all the trouble. We should have done that right 10 minutes ago. So, thank you for the invitation to visit Texas AM after this long period stuck uh, at our own institutions. Uh, so, I have decided to give you an overview of a program that is maybe not so close to activities here. But it's something uh, uh, we've been pursuing in Penn for a number of years, and it's trying to connect some aspects of string theory to particle physics. And this work is actually dealing with employing uh, what we call F theory to derive consistent models of particle physics. So, as I said, this is a part of a bigger program that we started probably yeah, eight, let's see, well, five to eight years ago, uh, where we try to develop both geometric techniques and of course, particle physics implications uh, in the context of so-called F theory. And uh, in, in recent uh, years led actually to consistent compactification of F theory that produces for us the actual gate symmetries and the particle spectrum of what we call standard model. So my focus will be, as I said, on this relatively recent work uh, where we managed uh, to construct uh, a huge number of particle physics models in this context that resulted in three families of quarks and leptons, and no chiral exotics, which is usually a difficult thing in the context of uh, string compactification. And in addition, we also got a byproduct um, of uh, having these constructions with the gauge group, uh, uh, with the gauge couplings that correspond to the gauge coupling unification, which is also intriguing. So um, I will try to basically introduce some of the key building blocks in, this, in the constructions and then highlight the actual outcome of the construction of this quadrillion example of um, three family standard models. Okay. Uh, the newer work focused on further developments or more refined understanding of the properties of this model. One that I didn't put here has to do with actually what we call modular stabilization, whether in these models we can um, stabilize moduli or what implications they could have. Uh, we published work on that, and the outcome is actually that it's somewhat hard if we want to use perturbative techniques of modular stabilization, uh, we have to exclude sizable number of models like that. That doesn't mean that other models don't have modular stabilization mechanisms, but they are not of the standard ones where we have well-developed perturbative techniques. The main focus here would be to highlight some of the progress that we have done in identifying further the matter spectrum. So when I'm talking about three families of quarks and leptons, I'm talking about the chirality of the uh, matter fields. Uh, but we want more refined data about matter uh, fields. Namely, we want to determine 
uh, whether we happen to have massless vector pairs as well that would produce the together same chirality, but we could have extra massless vector pairs. We should be considered vector exotics because we have not found them at the colliders. Okay, so in this context, to determine the actual number of charged a massive a massless vector pairs is an important further uh, uh, question that we have to uh, 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 quantify and that uh, hinges on, on, on quite advanced difficult geometric questions. So I'll try to highlight our progress in determination of the charge vector matter pairs, uh, namely the exact spectrum. What we would want to do as an exercise about stand, having standard model, three family standard model, is not to have any vector exotics, right? And also, what, what we would like to make sure to have what we call minimal standard model to have only one pair of Higgs doublets. Okay. They're also vectors, right? Charge vectors, because they come in, in this one single pair. And so exact determination where in this compactification we would have examples with no vector-like exotics and only one pair of Higgs doublets would be technically an important uh, advance uh, and would lead to quantifying where we have constructions of having exact minimal supersymmetric standard model. So that's based on more recent work. Uh, I've uh, uh, done with Martin Bees, postdoc now at Penn, and a uh, former student, Muyang Liu, postdoc now in, uh, in, at Uppsala. Uh, and for that, we really had to involve heavy duty mathematicians from the Navi and um, his student, Mariel Ong, to, to make further advances in the termination of vector pairs. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, we've done some further work also with Muyang and Martin in some classification of uh, uh, possible constructions to determine where we would have just uh, examples of no vector exotics. Uh, but this part of having, easy to show that you don't have it, but to have exactly one is a very hard question. I don't have a definite answer to that, but it's a work, a work that we are uh, also uh, working on with John, uh, Mariel, and Martin. All right. So, uh, so I thought I will give you a, a bit, uh, you know, overview, just a sense of how uh, the approaches in constructions of uh, particle physics arise within FTO. Okay. Uh, so, just few building blocks that are part in the constructions of uh, uh, models in F-theory. So uh, F-theory itself um, describes what I would like to call geometric phase of strongly coupled safe type to be stream theory. That's typical perspective that we take and what the data that we get in this context is geometry, is the nature of the geometry of uh, the compactification, the strongly coupled uh, uh, regime of type to be string theory. So we describe compactification of F theory as a compactification on elliptically torus fiber compact space whose base, the weak coupling regime is Calabi-Yao threefold. But now with this, in this number, uh, strongly coupled regime, this elliptic vibration is over uh, uh, three complex dimensional killer base, basically back reacted base of original calabi space where the strongly coupled Brains are allowed those ways to become non collapsible. So, this geometrical description of compactification basically uh, encodes the manifestly 
as invariant property of type 2 theory because the module parameter of the torus vibration parameterizes the string coupling and additional Ramon field coupling that is manifestly SLPC invariant. Okay, so this is geometrically encoding the manifest as duality of non perturbative type 2 theory. Uh, so uh, for our specific uh, purposes, the typical prototype of elliptic vibration is, uh, uh, is, is describing it as a hyper plane constraint in a weighted projective space with coordinates weighted by three to one. So this is the Weierstrass parameterization uh, of this um, elliptic vibration where this complex coordinate in the vibration, okay, as well as, of course, the coefficients become functions of the base, okay? They actually become specific sections uh, for F and G of the anti canonical divisors in the base, and uh, correspondingly, also, as I said, uh, the complex coordinates also. Uh, um, are, uh, become uh, specific uh, sections of the base. What's the relation between the one to the base? No, this is this is how I describe the elliptic curve. This is only one complex dimensional space because you know this gives me two complex dimensions, and this is an extra constraint, right? Gives me the uh, uh, another complex, so, so this is one complex parameter, right? And I have to make it such that uh, when, uh, so, so this elliptic curve described now this just as coordinates, okay? They become now functions of the base, okay? So that becomes a specific vibration of the base. And what I have to emphasize, the whole base itself, has to be special space. It has to be Calabial space. Okay, so this then ensures the fact that this vibration produces at the end for me the Calabial uh, forces, all those uh, coefficients, right, to be particular specific functions of the base coordinates. Okay, and so that is that where algebraic geometry kicks in, right. Uh, 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 so, uh, uh, so uh, for the sake of having compactification that is supersymmetric in four dimensions, this elliptic vibration over the scalar base has to together uh, form um, uh, a calabial space. In the total space. The total space, okay? But so uh, let me just point out again, we want compactification down to four dimensions, right? The old story was if we just had this Calabi-Yau base that was three complex dimensional space. This provides now in geometry two extra, one complex dimension. So we are dealing with four complex dimensions. So this elliptically fiber calabi space is calabi fourfold. So eight real dimensions, everything is complex here. So it, Four complex dimensions. So, so that's not that that's a we are adding real dimensions. This is a geometric tool to deal with the manifest SL to Z invariance of non perturbative uh, of non perturbative uh, uh, type to type of amplification. Okay, so to be in four dimensions, this Calabial uh, space has to be um, for four. That portfolio and the basis of this dimension first. Now it's more to the story to ensure that okay, there would be singularities popping up. This won't be a smooth calabial space to describe the, the gauge degrees of freedom, but it will be singular space. And this singularities in the vibration will happen along particular loci 
of certain two dimensions in lower in the base. So very specifically, the type of uh, singularity in two dimension, complex two dimension one. So along the divisor in in the base that we will encounter. Uh, uh, so the fiber degenerates along certain divisor and the singularity, the type of singularity signifies the appearance okay, of non perturbative brain, namely the, the brain charged by P and Q charges in general. Okay? And of course, the manifest SL2Z uh, uh, properties, right? Monodromy and all that are precisely compatible because of the uh, compatible with what we expect for that type of brains in this context. So, oops. So uh, typically the type of singularity that we would encounter uh, are uh, associated with so-called ADE singularities and they signify the type of non-abelian gate symmetry that would be associated with appearance with those singularities in this particular compactification. Okay, so maybe a, 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 sh a short uh, uh, digression about that. Uh, I should just mention this as a side thing. It so happens that these singularities in the base uh, are associated with non abelian gate symmetry. If we are talking about the appearance of abelian gate symmetry, they are different in nature. They're associated with the appearance of special sections in the vibrations that produce for us regular divisors. And those sections are two properties associated with what we call model data. I don't have time to talk about it, but uh, some of this stuff is reviewed. Unfortunately, uh, this review is cut off here in this picture. <laughs> so that was. Anyway, so we, uh, it, it's actually something I worked on with collaborators. Uh, it, it's cut off. It's a very big link. Um, and it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a published review on those aspects that, that are based on, on uh, some past lectures in 2017. Anyway, let me just continue just to highlight a little bit the notion of this non abelian gate symmetries. So as I said, you know, we have this elliptic uh, vibration by stress normal form. We are talking about uh, a, a divisor, right? Uh, in the base along this locus, there is a singularity that takes place, vibration degenerate. And uh, the type of vibration that we, uh, I mean, the type of singularities that we encounter uh, has to do with the order of banishing of this F and G coefficients uh, along with the corresponding discriminant. Okay, that was actually this classification of the type of order of vanishing and classification of that I was at by Kodaira. Okay, and so actually, when you have a particular example with the vanishing of order of certain order of F and G, for example. Uh, uh, produces uh, now one of those ADE singularities. And now what we do is we resolve the singularity. We resolve them. So this uh, is resolved. And it's built out of single P1s, CP1s. So, for example, a particular resolution of IN type singularity, when resolved, will produce for us, like, say, five P1s. Okay. And those P1s, the way they tie to each other in resolution, a one to one correspondence with the corresponding Dinkin diagram, in this case for SUN symmetry. Okay. So, uh, I think this is A N minus one singularity. The result produces for us that type of. Um, uh, chain of P1s. And now we can interpret again in, the, in, in this context what is happening from geometry is that, uh, that the number of these P1s is in one to one correspondence 
with one comma one form in this resolved Calabi space. So through Poincaré duality, we identify one comma one forms with each of those P ones, and this forums then in KK type reduction expand the C three potential. That's the one borrowed from M theory. Okay, the corresponding four dimensional gauge bosons. Those are the Cartan gauge bosons. Okay. So basically, this forms or one to one percent of the ones they support in KK reduction through this potential. We'll hear about this potential over and over again. The corresponding U1 gauge bosons that sit in the Cartan. The non abelian guys in this context are also there and they are associated effectively through this FM theory duality, through M2 brain wrapping these excitations. Okay. And they complete all the gauge bosons of particular, in this case, A n minus one or A four singularity, okay, into all the gauge bosons associated with S2 five in lower dimension. Okay, so this is the origin of this non abelian gauge symmetry. And as I said, abelian one is somewhat different, no time to go into that. All right, so this is where we get the gauge bosons from geometry, right? Now we go to the next stage, okay, and have say two divisors in the base that intersect. Okay, so they intersect, those are, uh, you know, along these directions, the fibration degenerates, say in, in type one, A type, single like this one, another single. At this intersection, okay, we are dealing with co dimension two singularity. That's also singular fiber there. And we identify matter field with the location at this co dimension to singular. So, uh, so this is where we in geometry identify the appearance of matter fields or dimensions. Uh, now it turns out that it's not sufficient to deal only with the geometry if we want to talk about the chirality of matter. If we have n equal to supersymmetric matter, geometry is enough, but now we have to explicitly introduce also field strength of the C3 gauge potential borrowed from F theory and theory duality. Okay, so you have to turn this on to actually get chiral matter. And, and this is all the difficulties that we are dealing with as matter is a concern. Uh, so again, um, uh, here are these good dimension two singularities, singular fiber. We resolve it. Typically, the singular fiber becomes I2 type fiber. And then we are wrapping now isolated M2 matter curves borrow from M theory, okay? And determine the representation of the matter through intersection theory of this matter curve intersecting the result fiber, okay? So there's again geometric way of identifying what is the actual representation of this matter, right? There I argued about the joint representation because here I'm arguing this comes from actual Geometric calculation to identify the actual representation of this matter. Well, very naively, you would think at this point, if this is SUM, this is SUM, that would be like some by fundamental. Okay, but not always. There is more in the structure how this intersection. So this, this, there are geometric techniques to determine representation, but to determine chirality, we have to identify further the non-trivial G4 uh, field strength. All right, so those are in words, but at the end, arguing geometry, how geometry fixes the actual uh, gauge degrees and matter degrees of freedom. Uh, and then, you know, this divisors, right, intersect that will matrices, but then when three of them intersect, this is where we identify the appearance of Yukawa coupling. And in principle, there are techniques Geometrically, we see a coupling, but now it depends on this flux to determine the strength of the Yukawa coupling. There are techniques 
to advance at least holomorphic Yukawa couplings. So what I mean, you know, it's it's fun, it's complicated. We have the potential, the potential. Anyway, it's the superpotential part that makes this holomorphic Yukawa coupling that we could in principle that. But just you know, somehow this is giving you a sense that just for this charge degrees of freedom, right? We have to involve this heavy duty singular geometry resolutions and so on to, to determine what is actually the gate symmetry and the actual matter representation that appears. Good question. Yes, please. So, yeah. uh, what if you, is there a possibility yeah. of having uh, an isolated singularity for dimension zero? And what is that response? Uh, well, could I mention no? This is could I mention three? You know, it goes, and that's already a point because if we are in three dimensional space and all, everything's complex, oh, could I mention? Okay. okay. So when I say dimension, it's all complex now. Okay. It's powerful homomorphicity that actually allows us to do something. Okay. At least with algebraic geometry techniques. Okay. Anyway, so let's go on a brief. Uh, so, okay. So those are just like. Building blocks giving you a glimpse of where it's coming from, right? There's there is heavy duty technology here, but giving you a glimpse where it's coming from. And now, how do we do? How do we now proceed with consistent construction? So I want to give you a glimpse of that. Okay. First, we have to find a elliptic curve that we will fiber, right? I showed you this wire stress representation. That's the prototype. Okay. But what I want to use is some other representations of elliptic curves that uses the power of toric geometry, okay? The data, because in toric geometry, where I'm describing spaces, the generalizations of weighted projective spaces, I can, uh, I can use some of the mathematical advances that will allow me to calculate these intersections, to calculate, you know, so, so to really use techniques there, it's much easier because mathematicians have developed this whole field of generalized way to project this. Field. So even like this elliptic curve that I want to fiber, right, over the base to get Calabria purple, I'm going to write it as a hypersurface. So this is a complex equation, just like I did Bierstrass, right, in two dimensional. Uh, uh, Toric variety, okay. Namely, those would be two complex dimensional generalized weighted projective spaces. Okay, so projective space is obvious, but now it, there are some subtleties with generalizations because we don't allow just homogeneous corners. We have like blow ups that that could have a description. So anyway, that was classified by mathematicians in two complex dimensions. There are only 16 of them as the uh, and and their data is described in terms of what you call uh, uh toric polytopes so to know what weights are what coordinates are we describe that in toric polytopes okay and then we write specific uh, uh specific uh hypersurface equation which ensures this has to be now has to be elliptic curve so it's calabria one Torus, right? It's a Calabria one pole. So this is just the curve. Now we have to fiber it. Okay. Now fibration, as I said, now in, in general, using this polytopes, hyper surfaces in polytopes, this is elliptic curve, fiber over three dimensional base and ensure that conditions are such that the resulting space is Calabria four pole. Okay. So when I choose only this polytope, storing polytopes in this construction, um, of course, all these coefficients in the hypersurface equation and the coordinates, uh, right? Coordinates themselves and coefficients here become, of course, uh, functions of the base. They, they are lifted to sections of specific, you know, line bundles of the base. So those are just conditions that ensure that this construction results in Calabria fourfold. Okay. So I'm sorry this is now being <laughs> cut off, but um, so. Um, it turns out that you know when we choose this vibration just it, uh, uh, to be associated with this uh, two-dimensional polytopes, it uh, their dependence of all these coefficients and coordinates uh, is specified uh, only uh, in terms of 
certain divisors in the base. Okay, and I'm, I'm referring them to, to so called anti canonical divisor. This is this whole thing that covers any space. Uh, and then there is the two additional, I call it S7 and S9 divisors. It's just technical stuff, it's specific. Anyway, this is Calabria. We have techniques of constructing it at the algebraic geometry level. Okay. Oh, all right. But I need more. I already indicated I need chiral matter. For that, I have to turn on this field strength of preform potential borrowed from M theory. Okay. Uh, so I have to construct the type of flux. Okay. So uh, it has to be representative of a certain fourth cohomology of this Calabria four co. And it has to sit in what we call middle cohomology, not to induce super potential, because we want it also to only to induce the chirality. We could study this other potential uh, fluxes later, but this is related to stabilization of moduli. But just as far as chirality goes, middle cohomology uh, uh, G4 flux, okay, when integrated over the matter surface, you see that was the matter, that was this intersection. This is co dimension two. And then it's a, it's a vibration, right, of the uh, part of the matter, uh, in, uh, part in the fiber, okay, over the base that uh, builds for us uh, two complex dimensional surface, CR. And we integrate, uh, so two complex dimensions, this is four, right, it's real, with this integrating over the surface. Um, uh, uh, produces for us the amount of chiral matter. By the way, you can derive that from type 2p limits and so on. So this is a result, this is topological, very much topological, but it depends on the flux, okay? So it's important to be able to find the geometry of these matter curves, construct this middle cohomology fluxes, and then see what the result is about the chirality of your matter field that appear at this intersection. In any case, that's not all. What is really again hard, we are not done only to have compactification consistent, it's not only geometry that is Calabria or Corpol. We also have to make sure that once we turn on this flux, you see, once we turn on flux, we are sourcing some charges in the internal space. And this charge cannot get out of complex space, okay? A uh, compact space. So this is, uh, in other ways, you know, this flux actually source is a source for D3 uh, brain point-like objects uh, in internal space, okay? It sources this number of D3 brains, okay? And then there's uh, additional complication because of FM theory, uh, and it has to satisfy this condition, and this is the Euler number of Calabria of Corpo. Okay. So this is condition that there is no net charge going out of this compact space. Okay. And you know, my experience, whenever we have to deal with fluxes, even in perturbative physics, that always is hardest to satisfy. Okay. To make, and this is what we call globally consistent. We have to satisfy that or it's not consistent. Sometimes people turn on this flux to satisfy that they have to put anti-brains. So we have to make sure that this condition is always satisfied to have consistent, uh, globally consistent compactification with positive integer number of three brains. And then there's also the quantization of G4 flux, which is also another canon of one. Okay? Anyway, those are these conditions that we have to satisfy. And then we would claim we have consistent compactification of Calabria or F theory on Calabria fourfold with certain gate symmetry, certain matter fields that have that chirality, and it's globally consistent. Right? So those, this is the those, this is application of these ideas to finding consistent models. So we would like to construct standard model. Originally, people were basing like eight years ago, they were basing it on some constructions with F25 guides was easier, just one divisor, I think. But we wanted to push this further 
because of phenomenological issues with guards and all that, to get directly construction that would have the gate symmetry of the standard model. Okay. And it so turns out that one of these polytopes is very, it's perfectly suited to find this gauge group factor. It happens that the, actually the elliptic curve that is constru uh, constructed as hypersurface constraint in this type of polytope, this is the data denoted is actually associated with P2 coordinates, but then blow ups at four points there and the, the actual weights and all that is encoded in, in, in this uh, polytope data and we now impose hypersurface constraint that has to be such that this is first uh, elliptic curve so Calabria one fold okay and so it depends again of course on coordinates of this polytope right and then uh, it turns out to involve six coefficients, right? So now this is elliptic curve, and now we have to promote elliptic curve oops, to Calabria, right? And so now, uh, uh, so we actually, uh, uh, I hinted at this construction, so now we are really constructing explicitly for this polytope, the Calabria fourfold, so all these coefficients in the hyperspace, uh, in, in the hypersurface constraint become specific sections of line bundles on, on V3. Use the, the Tory techniques to determine what these line bundles look like. So these coordinates become line bundles of that type, uh, sections of that type of line, line bundles that involve hyperplane constraint. Uh, anti canonical divisor, exceptional divisors, because that's in the yeah, coming from the separation. But now coefficients S1 to S10 that enter this uh, hypersurface constraint are also sections of very specific line bundles. And this is what I want to emphasize it depends on anti canonical divisor line bundles that you draw from anti canonical and two more. Divisors, namely, you know, divisor associated with S7 or divisor associated with S9, and the rest, Calabria constraints forces the rest to be very specific. Uh, so, so, this is sort of just to give you a hint that there is some real calculation and results for that. Um, so, we are here. We have now Calabria fourfold. Uh, now, where do we find gate symmetries? Okay, it's very much in the abstract. We are still using the space just specified by anti canonical divisor and specific divisors associated with S7 and S9 coefficients, the hyper uh, plane constraint. So, in any case, when S3 equals zero in this vibration becomes zero, we get co dimension one singularity. And that turns out to be associated with I2 fiber blows up into two P P1s. This is H bosons of SU2. So it's very special, this F11. And then this is this is really robustly. When S9 becomes zero, you get I2 type. So SU2 and SU3 are naturally part of this uh, type of choice of fiber. So it was a very useful example. And then, uh, then you know, to determine the U1 gate symmetry that's associated with appearance of additional sections in the elliptic vibration. Okay, this is a bit more technically. There's always zero section that is associated with this polytope intersection with the V0. This is where this section appears. And then uh, there's a, an extra section. This extra section in, the, um, in this elliptic vibration, right, that you identify uh, uh, is generates for us through what we call Schroeder map, an additional divisor that supports you on this horizontal device. Let me not go here, but this is guaranteed here. So here we are, there's an extra U1, and we get the, in, in the construction. So, so that's very general, not based much on the, on the, bay, uh, on the type of base, uh, uh, three dimensional base features. It's all coming from the way I identified this singularity structure from the federation. Okay, so, 
So it, it, it's quite intriguing that there is something that they will tell you. So we have constructed in principle compactification with the gauge group structure of the standard model. Okay. There's actually more with Ling we discovered that uh, we can actually further identify global structure of this gauge algebra that is associated actually with the center uh, 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 that that we a non-trivial center that it has, uh, and uh, has to uh, uh, this non-trivial center again is geometric. It comes from the way we really identify u one factors. It's not just this horizontal divisor. It's uh, it involves also this exceptional divisor. So the one. Anyway, uh, they are quite technical things. Actually, intriguing physics because it has to do with M theory, F theory, duality. Uh, but uh, with all this rambling, let me just say that we identify non-trivial central element, and now that I geometrically we were able to identify, you see these factors two and three that that turn for us as non-trivial Z6 element, and so the gate symmetry is actually. Have this global structure and the origin of global symmetry to be geometric, I think it's very intriguing property that we found uh, from F theory. By the way, we are pushing this idea beyond for the full fledged universality of uh, the, uh, consistent quantum gravity theories. So it's another, it could be another talk. But just as a side thing, this global structure of, uh, of the theory is also important because. Our matter has to be compatible with this global structure. But you know, we have geometric techniques to, to identify now the actual representation of the matter. So matter appears at co-dimension two singularities and it's associated with a constraint like this S3 section is zero at the location when S3 is zero and S9 is zero. This is where S3 and S2 intersect. Okay. And then similarly. We get things where the leptons live, but also Higgs doublets. Okay, and those are constraints for those matter curves. Okay, and and you know the uh, the right handed the up quark and down quarks. So we identify the location of and 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 the right handed electric uh, uh, location of all these matter curves, and then we use our intersection theory to determine their charges the whole representation and those are the extra u1 charges which are compatible post facto from also this geometric consideration by which we identify the global structure of the big symmetry all right so we so this is this is exactly the charges that we like for the standard model but the origin comes from this global thing global constraints on the gate structure and it's geometric so that that uh, also uh, yeah that, that there was quite some excitement uh, when one uh, saw this observation uh, uh, this geometric observation that constrained the global structure in any case that's not the whole story we have to do more now we have to get the chirality that depends how we construct this uh, this uh, homology uh, g4 flux and we have to pass it on. Okay, so uh, you know, five years ago we set out to do that. Okay, let's do it, and we did something very simple. Let's choose just a simple base P three. Cannot be simple. Construct a labial fourfold, right? And so we had, uh, yeah. When the base is so simple, then our divisors. Yeah, there's only hyperplane divisor, and we chose this at seven and and at nine divisors on which the construction depends okay of course they can only be multiple integers of hyperplane divisor p3 is very simple okay then we looked at which of these integers ensure that we are having calabial space and that happens only for a certain number of those integers those are the calabials subject to these properties okay then we constructed fluxes g4 fluxes this G4 fluxes then um, gave us chirality, and we have to make sure that we satisfy tap holes. Okay, so with our fluxes uh, choice, we we looked for solutions uh, that would have positive number of um, three brains. That's the 
global condition and also chorality. So we did that and we found a bunch for a bunch of these collabial spaces. We could satisfy these conditions with, with positive number of B3 brain, right? Globally consistent model and fixed number of families that came along with the right. There's not no freedom. And lo and behold, to our surprise, we found example with three families and reasonable number of B6 B3 brains. Okay. So this was actually the first three family model, right? Uh, models with simple space, just cut out and we found solutions. And it didn't look horrid, not like 50,000 B3 brains. Anyway, here it is. And that was naturally, you know, hinted. That this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. And indeed, was the tip of the iceberg, right, that led that now to this huge class of models okay, that we have. So let me just summarize how we got this now huge class of models. Is yeah, we took again the same uh, uh, vibration, right, with this uh, hyperplane constraint in this F11 polytope. Gate symmetry, I told you, doesn't care what the base is. This came all from the fiber properties. This is the gate symmetry. So we have standard model, all right? Now what we do, now we'll choose all possible three-dimensional Tory bases, not just the P3, but we'll cover all the 3D reflexive polygons. This is three complex dimensions, so those are much more, we have, not not 16 of them like in two dimensional case right and we took but for the base we have lots of them we have four uh, over four thousand right um reflexive polytopes that is certain data but we can specify properties of each polytope okay but then oops but then uh, correspondingly um for each reflexive polytope there is more refined pain okay we have to construct different specific B3 bases, okay, that are associated with what bacteria, you know, classified as fine star regular triangulation of chosen polytope. So within each polytope, there are lots of bases that satisfy conditions, right, that, that we require from the polytope, okay. Uh, so uh, this different triangulations. Uh, are associated in principle with different bases because they determine different intersections of divisors. Okay, so they're huge. I mean, you already have 4,000 polytopes. Now, think of it the more complex polytope is, the more triangulations you have. Okay, uh, so it's a huge number of bases. Okay, now, so we took them, all of them, they are classified by Kreutzer's uh, Karka uh, data uh, and uh, we did something more. We could choose um, this, this constructions depend on choice of this device, uh, S7 and S9 divisor. And we could choose different ones because different bases could have different, like, like you know, for P3, we took this hyperbase. Now we do something special. So there's another, we have lots of bases, huge number, but we also choose this divisor special. So this is our engineering. And this is sort of cool because. Once you calculate the size of the divisor associated with SU3 and SU2, their size is governed just by k bar. The size of divisors tells us how big, what is the gauge coupling, the strength of gauge covering the theory. Since it, both of them have the same volume, it's in, that means that both gauge couplings are the same. So this was really, it's sort of nice byproduct, okay? Calculation of the SU1, uh, divisor is more complicated. I told you it's sort of different horizontal divisor associated with these extra sections of the vibrations, but you can do careful calculation and you determine that the gauge coupling of this uh, associated with this divisor properly calculated the volume, right, will give us precise number uh, about the proportionality of this gauge coupling to the volume of the bar. This factors. This is not put in, this is calculated, but this is precise in the gauge of communication. Right? So, but somehow, somehow guaranteed, right? By, by once we chose this device, we get some 
Yeah, and that, that you know, excited some people because, you know, it's, uh, again, this is a five product, it's so different. All right, so time is ticking. Okay, let me just, uh, I, I see I, I spend spending more time, but I hope I'm at least telling you some of your uh, some first glimpse things that we would be doing. So now we have to go to non the G4 flux. We have to get three families, right? That's what we want, and satisfy test flux, okay? Now we could use also, because of the story data, we could classify this middle cohomology fluxes in terms of uh, one comma one forms, okay, uh, uh, on this Calabria story Calabria fourfold, uh, and use the uh, this forms because they have created dual divisor classes to build that as basis element of this middle cohomology four forms. In some way, you know, this is the basis of of middle cohomology four forms. You see those divisors, right? This will give you uh, effectively one element in this 2,2 middle cohomology G4 terms. And then we are dealing with the coefficients. This coefficient is now uh, on this uh, base tangent of this G4. This coefficient is now a parameter, okay? So what happens with this expansion of, of, of G4, okay, both chirality and D3 cat forms into N G4 uh, in integrality uh, turns out to be all, all these conditions become sort of geometric. They become expressed in terms of some intersection number of these basic divisors, building blocks in this construction and uh, make it even more special by choosing this S7 and S9 divisor to be anti-canonical divisor, everything becomes related to intersection of anti-canonical divisors, okay? And for example, chirality becomes triple intersection of anti-canonical divisor in the whole D3, you know, the way, and it's proportional to this coefficient, okay? So this is, for example, geometric way of how you relate chirality triple intersection of this divisor when you do special S7, S9 to be associated only with an canonical divisor. Similarly, you know, oh, this I have to emphasize, this is the core of the whole thing. We want three family construction. This tells us that this coefficient A is inversely proportional to triple intersection. So this A could be in principle rational number, not just integer, but it's rational number, and that tells us that we are constructing fluxes that have this specific rational coefficient. Okay, so uh, and now uh, so this is chirality, for example, and then uh, the number of the three brain rays, right? Positive number, tackle cancellation, also comes out expressed only in terms of triple intersections of anti-canonical divisor in this case, right? So it's all geometric, and we love to call this, you know, really the somehow this global consistency condition uh, is um, depends only in this case on triple intersection. It is important statement that is unfortunately cut out now again has to do with the fact that it's independent of triangulation because triple intersection anti canonical is the same for all the bases of a particular polytope. So this is pretty universal, right? That's, I mean, there are finer data that will depend on the base, but not this one. All right, so all we have to do is we'll take three families. This is our tadpole condition. It looks like that now. And we have to find for which value, for which polytopes, actually, this is satisfied. And it's satisfied for, for those in the Carter Kreutzer data for large number, satisfies integer positive numbers. So those are globally consistent models. Okay. And it's just polytope dependent. So if you have comp the, the uh, you know the complexity of polytopes grows, lots of bases. Okay. Now you have to count what are all the bases, right? And that grows very fast. So from all this polytopes that may satisfy it. Now we have to count the bases within each of these polytopes. If they are of a simpler structure, we can use combinatorics. Okay. 
but for large ones, uh, that hasn't been fully determined. Okay, so we use approximate method that Halverson developed in other contexts. What we use is we use this fine triangulation on the facets, which are 2D. This, this, this you can do. But then we estimated what happens for full fledged 3D phase and our estimate then led to, to the order of billion consistent construction. So that, uh, that, that is the, the gist of the key text. Okay. So since I'm running out of time, but let me just highlight what, what the hard things are nowadays. Okay. So, um, so what we want to do is not just having models for which we, we want to know how many vector pairs we have in all these constructions, okay? And for that, we need more refined data, okay? We know those are chirality, we know, we know gauge group, we know, right, uh, all the global consistency things. But the number of vector pairs is associated with more refined data because we really have to get not just G4, but we need more refined data about T3, and that's involved in more involved homologies. This would be our G4, but this is the example that, that, that would be more refined C3 data, okay? And that's called the so-called Berlin homology. Uh, and that's very hard, okay? This is the problem because it's a large dimension, okay? Very hard to do. But if we were able to quantify precisely what is the basis of the T3, not just G4, okay? We, uh, when we would have the C3 potential identified in the fourfold, we would then restrict that to each of the meta curve, right? And, and so when we restrict the C3 to each of the meta curves, so on each meta curve, okay, this C3 defines line bundles, it's meta curve only, and it zero cohomology would tell us how many massless matter fields we have in representation R. And then H1 will tell us how many we have in representation R bar. Okay. So if both of them are zero, that would tell us, you know, if this were four and this were one, we would have construction with chirality three, four minus one. And we would have one vector pair because it would be H1 equal one with R bar together with an extra fourth one there. Okay, so if we identify more refined data, not this one only, that was much easier to do, but specifically that we would get precise information on uh, on the vector pairs. Now you see this number could change as we change the shape of the base, namely complex structure, right? This is very much protected by you know topologically, but this one would jump. As we move the shape, and that's what we wanted to understand. Where in the complex modulized space of this base, we would have situation where, for example, we had no vector pairs of charge quarks, but we would have exactly one Higgs pair. That and that that's a very very hard. We, we learned that over the last two years. This is very hard problem, and we warned. Uh, 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 yeah, so I'm saying just precisely those things in words. That's what you want to do. Um, and it's very hard. So there are a number of technical things, but I should say just as a warm up last year, what we did, we just took some other baby, more baby example when we constructed some toy model, that model, where we could really trace precisely the number of uh, vector pairs there, but their construction was such that the matter um, uh, curves were this hyperplane constraint in particular with the projective space, but line bundle were direct pullbacks of line bundle in this ambient space. So that was infinitely easier to fix that uh, and determine how as you change modular space of DP3, what is the number of, uh, uh, of your, uh, it's, uh, what is your exact matter spectrum and learn new things about so-called Brunetter theory, under what condition the number of vector pairs changes. And we also use machine learning techniques just to be topical. Anyway, uh, 
but uh, for what I will show you, what I have showed you for this construction, this is much harder. Okay. And one difficulty that lies for the real stuff that we want to do take, lies in the fact that the three family models uh, that are globally consistent are associated with fraction number of the same. And those are not easy bundles, line bundles to identify. Um, it's associated with what one calls root bundles. But it's more complicated. If this were integer, then one would be dealing with somewhat easier construction. So that's already one complication. Okay. Uh, so root bundles are basically, you know, if you have coefficients that is integer and you multiply uh, that is rational, you multiply this by inverse of that number, then G prime looks integer. So that's a more straightforward line bundle construction. Okay. Now you have to construct a root of it to get the one that you want, right? And that's, uh, that's a tough thing. So let me not, uh, since time is really, yeah, I, I used up most of that, but let me just tell you two things, right? It's really, we are not far. I have to be really frank about that. Um, to find the precise root bundles that we encounter in our constructions, we would have to go to, regional proper construction of C3, identify the basis restricted to, the, to, to all the meta curves and find line models there. This is very hard. We cannot do it yet. So we are dropping that. Right. So what we advance somehow is what I would like to call bottom-up analysis. Okay? I won't say that this root bundle comes from top-down restriction of C3 down. But I'm going to try to find all the root bundles on particular meta curve and hope one of them is the root bundle that comes from top down. Okay, so that is really what I call bottom up approach. Okay. And that's, that's what we managed to do a bit by realizing, yeah, first on, on this aspect and this one is still open. Okay, so we wanted to see under what conditions. We have root bundles that produce for us really no vector pairs, right? That H0 is three and H1 is zero, right? Uh, so even that is hard. So bottom-up construction of root bundles is also, you know, it, it, it's non-trivial. Um, for example, for one of the example, for one of the polytopes with this triple intersection, well, matter curves are that, but then we can we can identify precisely the line bundle data, how it's related to anti-canonical divisor. This fraction number then appears that P, the line bundle is not anti-canonical uh, line bundle to integer power, but some fractional power. And it's this fractional power that we want to grasp, right? Um, so it's a prototype as, as bottom-up construction. And even that is very hard. On smooth curves, that's very hard to do. But one can do that. By the way, spin bundle is a special case because this is key bar to one half. So blocks together with spin bundle makes it this line bundle, a root bundle for us on a meta curve that would tell us how many vector pairs we have. But we cannot do it on smooth. So what did we do? We change the smooth curves. We change complex structures such as the smooth curves become nodal. And there we have mathematicians. They happen to construct root bundles on nodal curves. Okay. So using really no singular curves, construct root bundle there with their techniques, and then go back and see what we can say about the smooth one. Okay. And so for the case when we have no vector pairs, that's awesome. Okay. I'll just use a minute. Right? That's enough of your time. So just, just to give you a glimpse. So what we did, we took bottom up. This is particular meta curve. We made it singular, no doubt. We built it out of component. You see, this curves have huge genus. How they become nodal, they they at the node, and we got a nodal curve. And then um, 
And then we use mathematician's way of constructing line bundle on blow up of this nodal curve. This is root bundle here now. Uh, so, so, so there are techniques with dual graphs. I have some pictures how we do this. It's an example how we construct something that is a third root of k bar square. That's what we needed. So we constructed first k bar square. This is some dual graph. Those are the no, no, those are the components of this single curve. Those are the nodes. Uh, then we deal with the trees and make everything divisible by three. Then we take third root and we end up with the third root of k bar square construction that is made out really of section. It's not one third of a point. It's really it's zero are distinguished points. You see, this is division by three in this construction. And then this is the final thing of the, of the case of the of this bundle, uh, oh, sorry, of this line bundle that is third root of k bar square. All right, so we have an example of that type, and we constructed the case that has h0 exactly three and h1 equals zero. So, so, uh, so this was the case that managed to construct. So by, by this mathematician's techniques, this is now this nodal one. Now we know if we go from nodal one, we are sure this is root bundle with a zero equal three, no vector pairs. It's root bundle and no vector pairs. Then, you know, as we go to smooth one, that's the one that we want to have there, what we call upper semi-continuity, okay? Can only keep you there. Because smoothing out, what it can do, it can only pair up some vector pairs, but I don't have any vector pairs to begin with to pair up. So any kind of deformation to the smooth case will keep me at a zero equal three and no vector pair. Okay. And so, so so this is just a little glimpse of it. We could classify that, can enumerate how many we have and all the stickers. We've done that. We published extra papers on this classification of a zero equal three conditions under which we have root bundles. We can count this efficiently, get them all. Um, but uh, this is just a limited bottom up approach for not having any vector pair. We know where in module space we don't have any vector pairs. But to have one Higgs doublet, we, we are not there yet. And time is gone, and I cannot tell you new results on that. Um, we are using the, yeah, both geometric techniques and Higgsing techniques to argue under what condition as we go from root bundle at singular to smooth bundle. That this extra vector pair that we constructed at this, at this nodal curve, right, will not get massive as we go to smooth one. Right, that, that's that's how we want to ge geometrically we have to quantify under what conditions that fancy graphs, but maybe I should just wrap it up. Okay, so so in this uh, yeah one hour five minutes I think I'll I I try to give you some glimpse of of this program and uh, where it's leading us really to to, to quite tough geometric questions. It's very puzzling because we have so many cases. It's such a restructure, right? But at this step, it becomes harder to quantify further features of constructions. Very questions. Uh, and then online. Can I just ask? So, so just to mm -hmm. bottom line. You, you have, you get examples which give you exactly the fields of the standard model, particle, I mean, without extras. Uh, I cannot tell you how many Higgs tablets I have. Oh, okay. okay, because his tablets are back to peers. Oh, I, I can tell you where I am in the constructions where I don't have any vector charge matter, just three quarks and a lot. And this issue of modulus stabilization, so I mean, right. is that an issue here? Or do you have to 
yes, it is an issue here, is right? It solved, is it? Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, we we studied the domain of these constructions in which we could have perturbative flux, tender supergravity flux uh, stabilization, right? Because that's not, um, or or perturbative. Um, uh, uh, super potential uh, that depends on modula that we would use, like using perturbative Wolchid instant on the That brings us in a domain, okay, in the domain of moduli that is more constrained, okay. We reduce it from, you know, 10 to the 16. If, if you want to stick to, to techniques where you have calculational methods, right, for modular stabilization. Uh, we reduce the number of, of these constructions to, to just one range. I think k bar cube has to be smaller than a certain number. So we reduce a lot of uh, the, the same is the following. No, we have not stabilized all the moduli, but where we they have calculational techniques is relatively small among these quadrillion models. Okay? We are done 10 to the five of them where I can use perturbative modular stabilization techniques, right? So just a prerequisite, okay? That doesn't mean that there is a modular stabilization in other domains, it's just a synchronous. Yeah, it's a hard thing, and, and very few people both at the same time. Okay, here's focus is on charge, right? Part of it is hard. Mm -hmm. It's a separate talk, actually, but as, as, I, as I was, uh, I, I, I knew I won't get to there. And one has to be frank, right? The devil, you see, the devil is in the details, right? And, uh, and many people gave up on it, but it's so hard. So hard, right? For payoff of telling you whether I have one fixed pair or not. Mm -hmm. but, but compared to other perturbative constructions, because I work on it over yeah, most of my career. Um, there we were dealing typically with um, Carol exotics, and it was somewhat limitation of constructions. Here, tor tor techniques more forward. That ever had. Nobody has such landscape, right? Heterodi guys, they have ten to the five. That's the right at best. Um, Is it a good thing or bad thing? <laughs> Yeah, well, Actually, it would know. sound much less uh, expensive if you use the British. Yes, that's because... 10 to the 24. <laughs> I know. It's so very. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it, it's really it's frustrating thing, right? Because everybody, those formal tiers go, oh, we can find all those models. Then you ask them, do it. Okay, nobody can do it, right? Or they do, and others do it, and then they have all those problems, right? Uh, and now you, you say, okay, at least no Carl exotics, all this condition, and we have so many. Now, what do you say? You say, oh, why do you have so many? Okay, <laughs> you have so many. Now, that's not good either. So, so anyway, but I think it's sort of showing you that's how far you can get. So, had this happened 10 years ago or so, this would be really, you know, my, I, my view is from sociology of the community that would attract a lot of attention. But by now, there is wear and tear, right, in this program. So can people want to eat their pastures <laughs> for other questions. So do we have other questions? Nothing coming from. Okay, well, thank okay. you again. Well, thank you. Oh, I just, I did something bad because I just closed my laptop.